right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and, and maybe get started here. So I want to start off with a little bit of a uh, philosophical question and ask you, what is time? Say that again. What is time? Time? Hmm. I mean, we all experience it. Let me take that bait. Allez, vas-y. You what know, that's the one where even Augustine was like, so time is, um... <laughs> yeah. Hey, Sam, welcome. I heard an expert in philosophy and, like, quantum physics talk about time for an hour and a half and never explained it, never even came close to explaining it. Do you know it was really an hour and a half? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, how do you, how do you know uh, that it is? What is time? All right, so we're we're asking and hopefully answering the question, uh, what is time? <laughs> He says, anybody, answering the question. Anybody want to take a stab at it? I said I know better than to take that bait. There's Melody. Hi, guys. Hey, Melody. Hey, Ashley. Um, no, no takers on what is time? The measure measured duration of an event. Measured duration of an event. Did you define that? duration? <laughs> the length of time something takes. <laughs> exactly, nailed it. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole question of time is really philosophical. Um, there was this huge debate in the theological world not that long ago uh, over is God stuck in time or is he completely outside of time? And obviously, people like C.S. Lewis have, has described God and time as, as if he is completely outside, and they're two counter-exclusive categories, which I think is a little bit dangerous. But I also think to place God in time in the same way that we are in time uh, is maybe even more, more dangerous. Uh, Aristotle talked about time, and he talked about time as change, because change is the only way that we have... Brian's that measures time. Um, you know, the changing of the day, the changing of the position oh. of the sun, all, right. um, all of these things are, we notice the change because um, there's time. Hey, Matt, I'm going to mute you guys. So, okay, there we go. Um, so there's, he described it as change, which I guess is about as satisfying or unsatisfying as anybody else or, you know, like if you agree with this conclusion, then it's probably satisfying. And if not, then it's like, well, you know, what is time? See, change over time. Yeah. Um, so I start that off because in our passage today, we're going to uh, read about, uh, we'll read about time. Um, this is a song, a passage that was popularized by the Beatles. And so you're probably already vaguely familiar with it. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let me go ahead and share my screen. So you've got the text there. Let's go to ESV. There we go. Uh, so we'll be in chapter three. Um, and this is uh, starting verse one. It says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to love, uh, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. 
What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has put eternity in a man's hearts so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live, and that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so that people fear him. That which has already been, that which is to be, already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. So we'll delve into this passage uh, momentarily, but I want to hear from you. What are things in life that are hard for you to accept or that you don't want to accept? Um, because this, this passage seems to indicate there's kind of a time for everything, uh, you know, a time to eat food you like and a time to eat squash, uh, for instance. And so it, it seems like there are many, uh, with certain elements of time, there is, uh, there's a degree to which we cannot control it. It, it happens to us. There, it's unavoidable. It's uncontrollable. You know, we, day by day, we get older, whether we feel young or not, we just start getting older. Um, so today we're really talking about case study, his second case study. This is the sequence and duration of desirable and undesirable time periods that are all outside of our human control, whether they're good or bad, they're outside of our control. So what are things in your life that you want to change, but are outside of your control? This pandemic situation. <laughs> Just two on the nose, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else? Probably my health. Health? Yep. It's something we can't always change. <clears throat> to give a completely ridiculous answer, the fact that all the good food has cat ha is bad for you. Oh, this too is vanity. <laughs> if it's bad for you, why is it so delicious? Why does my right. body want it so much? I know when uh, my oldest daughter was graduating from high school, me and some of the other fathers were chatting about how we know this is the way this is supposed to go, but watching your kid drive off, you know, moving out and all that is it's still tough. No, mine didn't do that, so it's easier for me, but <laughs> I'm going to mute now. I'd like to be taller. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> I wish weeds didn't grow. What mm -hmm. I plant doesn't grow, weeds always come instead, and that gets me. <laughs> yeah, this too is vanity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, one of the unchangeables for me, it's the same for everybody, is just aging. Um, I used to be nearly invincible, and I'm getting back into mountain biking after years of not mountain biking, and I've learned many hard lessons about my own um, invincibility, and so that's uh, hard, hard to take, hard to accept, because I still want to be invincible. I never was, I know that, but. I felt that way. And now I'm, I'm past the point where I feel that way. Like I was going up to a jump the other day and I thought, oh, I'm going to hit the brakes and just save this one for another day. So. I think uh, one of the things we're going to see in this passage and in this book for that matter, as we continue to go through it, is one of the ideas about happiness is acceptance. Um, so we see Solomon striving and striving, and striving after all of these different categories. Last week was case study one, where he studied pleasure, uh, work, and wisdom. And now he's studying the process of time and inevitability, uh, if I can borrow a word from the Merovingian. Um, and so he, he's going through these different things that he's studying, and it seems like one of his one of his ad advices that keeps coming back around and around is 
it's good to enjoy what God has given us while we can enjoy it. Uh, but another one would be kind of the implication of acceptance. And that's typically where, for us, a lot of times that's what drives us to be unhappy. We don't accept that our money isn't the way we want it. Our body isn't the way we want it. Um, our health isn't the way we want it. Uh, our finances, our job, our like go down the list. And this creates kind of a striving to get to the next level, the next thing. And there's always the push. And, and so we, our culture is an achievement based culture. Other cultures, you are born into a particular status and a particular role based on your family, whether that's high, whether that's low. Um, if you're born into the, to the, you know, a high class family in the middle East or in the far East, that's just your status, regardless of, uh, what you do personally. Whereas for here, you can be born into the richest family in America. Your parents could write you out of their will and your family name counts zero for you. You could come from a completely impoverished family, uh, be very brilliant, talented, et cetera. And you can, you know, work your way up and, and make something of yourself financially. And so, um, that's kind of an unchangeable way. But for us in the West, our culture is, uh, achievement driven where I am rewarded or hurt based on the achievements. And so based on individual achievements, you know, did I get the right education? Did I go into the right career? Um, do I have the right family, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this constant drive for us. And it's like, I don't know if you've ever climbed a mountain where uh, you, you climb to the top and it looks like the top from the ground. And then you get up over this hill and you realize, well, that's just like the, the foot, the, like the hip to the next bit. And you go, okay, well, there's the top. And then you get up there and then that's just the, you know, the ramp up to the summit. And it goes and goes and goes like this. Um, I was listening to uh, an author talk about success. Uh, he's, he's a pastor now, but he had been a medical doctor and he grew up in an Asian home and he was talking about the family pressure to succeed, to become a doctor. And then he was a doctor. And so he had to get this, you know, special certifications, a certain amount of experience. And there's every time he thought he saw the next summit, it just, just turned out to be the next foothill to the mountain. And so I think we've probably all experienced something like that where, you know, right when you think you're supposed to be there, you realize, well, this is just another leg of the journey, which makes accepting this really, really uh, difficult. Um, so I wanna, I wanna go through the text uh, here for a minute. Um, he says that in, in verse one, he says that for everything, there's a season and a time for every uh, matter under heaven. Is anybody reading a different translation that has a different word from that word matter? By chance, I am. I have CSB, and it says uh, activity under heaven. Activity. New American Standard says event under heaven. Event. Um, the Abbey says activity. Activity. Okay. Yeah. So the um, the Hebrew word here can have many different meanings ranging from joy, delight, wish, uh, matter, business, appointment, etc. And so it's used in a lot of different ways, um, which should actually, it, it kind of is a perfect word for opening up this discussion because he's talking about kind of the highs and the lows. And so in verse two, he says, there's a time to be born and a time to die. It's actually should be literally translated. There's a time to give birth. Um, and so he's, he's talking about kind of that uh, life-giving force that people in their prime, um, so this is actually from the standpoint, that verse is from the standpoint of the parents, not from the standpoint of the children. There's kind of this life-giving force of a husband and wife in their prime bringing people into the world. And then the opposite of that is what happens to all of us, which is at the end of our life, we die. Um, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. Uh, then he goes into a little bit more violent things. There's a time to kill and a time to heal and to break down and a time to build up. Um, if you've ever been to really old cities, a lot of times the foundations of what you currently see is laid on, you know, hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of years of previous builds. And 
they get torn down and knocked over and then the next people come and just lay another foundation on top and and keep on building so he's kind of got this in his mind as he's as he's thinking through that um then he switches into more emotional language this is a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance um one of the interesting things about western culture that disconnects us from other cultures in the world is what is called triumphalism and so the history of our country is something like uh, a group of really brave and crazy and uh, people with ingenuity uh, a hard work ethic etc got on boats and came over here um, survived against all odds expanded through the west in a matter of a couple hundred years you know our country pushed to the top of the technological podium to the top of the military podium to the top of every podium imaginable in a couple hundred years we came out of nowhere uh, from a from a historic standpoint and this has has bred this sense of uh, we have plenty we have enough it's all going to be okay we're always going to be number one uh, we're always going to come out on top and then you you infuse this with christian language is like now we are god's chosen ones um, and so the history of westward expansion had this idea of what's called manifest destiny the idea that god has given us this task of sharing with the world everything we have from democracy to our technology to our better way of living um now i love democracy i love our better way of living but i don't think from a christian standpoint that's actually what what god has in store for us as christians or for us as a country so this makes it really hard for us to accept times of tragedy um i'm not going to ask you anybody to to admit to this but I, i'm just assuming that you've all been through a really hard time in your life i'm assuming that you would show up at church on sunday and you would hear very triumphant songs. Is Christianity about triumph? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does anybody have a counter opinion? No. <laughs> the same person. <laughs> Matt, you were beside yourself. It actually. Say it's about triumph through suffering. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I would say it's kind of a yes and no. Well, like, yes, right. ultimately, you know, Jesus comes back uh, carrying a sword and on a white horse and kills all his enemies and everything is set right. But Jesus also came where he was brutally murdered um, and nailed to a cross. And so it's, it's kind of a, a yes, but type answer. But think of our music. Can anyone name for me a modern, okay, not from a hymnal, a modern praise and worship song that deals with disappointment. No, they can't. <laughs> you can. You, you you know some. I'm I'm sure we can come up with some. Let's try to come up with some. Crickets. What do you mean by modern? Uh like i don't know the last 20 years <laughs> what about the song you say when it talks about uh, all of the things that the world says about you and but god says you're valuable okay so that's got a hint of uh a hint of mourning to it Right. Any, so we, we've come up with one as a group. You mean as a group? I'm here all by myself. <laughs> State your question again. Can you name any modern church songs that deal with church songs. struggle or that deal with the idea of mourning or the idea of failing? I would add to the list Oceans. Ocean Steep or whatever it's called. I don't know. Okay. Hello? Uh, the casting crowd. Does anybody hear her? 
Okay, that's a good one. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Good one. Yeah. Now, I, I have to exclude, um, oh gosh, Emily, I just forgot his name. What's uh, your mama's favorite music guy? <laughs> Andrew Peterson. Yeah, I have to exclude his stuff because he actually deals with a lot of these things. I was just that. about to use an Andrew Peterson song. Yeah, <laughs> me too, Melody. Not cool. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but he actually has embraced a lot of this other side of what I'm talking about. But, but aside from him, there's maybe five to ten of the top hundred Christian modern songs that that deal with suffering, uh, that deal with mourning, that deal with failing, that deal with where is God. Um, if you go into the hymnal, probably 15% of them, I would say 15%, deal with the idea of those kinds of topics. Um, in fact, if you get into Isaac Watts songs, he's got some amazing, amazing music uh, that deal with God. Why isn't stuff working out right? Uh, he says there. He has one song called called "How Long, O Lord." And part of the chorus is, "If you wait any longer, you're going to miss my last breath." Uh, and this is an old song. I think eighteen hundreds. But I mean, the idea is whoever's right. Whoever's the perspective of the writer is he's he's dying. He's in mourning. He's about to just keel over and if god doesn't come through for another split second he's not even going to be there to say time of death um obviously this is out of sync with our culture but what does that do for us who are struggling because everyone in here is struggling with something some disappointment and typically what we do is we put that in a box so we don't have to think about it and there's not really space in our service i don't mean specifically willcrest i would just say pretty much every church there's not really space in most church lives and most church culture for there to be a time for everything. I mean, we would say there's a time for rejoicing. And intellectually, we would say, yeah, there's a time for mourning, but we're not going to have any time for mourning today. Um, and so it, it creates this, uh, creates this silencing effect where you need to mourn and you need to mourn biblically, and you need for the body of Christ to weep with those who weep. Um, and you can't because everything's, yay, yay, Jesus, triumphant, it's all going to work out, which ultimately is true, right? And we know this to be ultimately true. But in the human experience, there is a time for everything, which in, in a way means everything is going to happen to us, you know, the weeping and the, the joy but I would say from a, how should we order our day? How should we think about our world? How should we set our mind on where is God? We have to take both sides into account. Um, when Job is going through his, his valley, if you will, um, his friends come up to him and they're all trying to suggest different ways to help him to help him understand what's going on. And they're explaining all of these reasons as to maybe it's this and maybe it's that. And there's one line in there where he says, should I receive good from God and not bad also? And he doesn't mean morally bad, okay? He's not, God's not going to do something morally bad to us. Calamity. Um, yeah, calamity. That's a good word. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, will I only just get good stuff? Now, again, as an American, this is much harder for us to understand because for us, I mean, on a global scale, we're pretty blessed. Um, we've got pretty much everything we need. I mean, we have all these wants. We all have probably an Amazon wish list. Um, I'm sure, you know, all of our lists are longer than they should be. And so we have plenty of wants, but we don't really have that many needs. If you think about it on a global scale. And yet we always ask this question, where is God? Why isn't this stuff happening? Um, without ever thinking like there's somebody who lives in a tin shack in Kibera in Nairobi who has to use a flying toilet, uh, who doesn't have enough to eat. Um, and yet, you know, here I am asking God to, you know, fix with that. Hey buddy, how are you? I'm kind of talking right now. You can hang out if you want. And so, you know, we sit there and we act like because we didn't get the job promotion that we want or 
the pay raise we want or whatever that little extra want, not need, you know, we act like God is somehow failing us when in, I mean, what makes us think that we are so special that we should get a second helping and a third and fourth and fifth and sixth before many people in the world have even had their basic needs taken care of. Um, so I want us to think about that idea of it's, it's not just uh, good things happening, but it's also bad. Are you going to bed? Mm-hmm. All right. Sorry. So good. All right. <laughs> Sorry, my mind time ritual. Um, it's, you know, we always have this, and again, I think there's multiple layers happening, right? The fact that we have been blessed so much already, and we, most of us don't know what suffering and lack is like. Um, as we're going into this time, a lot of people, as all of our, you know, 11 billion options for everything are going out the window. As long as all, you know, our, all of our options are going out the window, we're learning um, one, we had way too many options for, say, cereal or, you know, name the category. Uh, two, we really can't live without it. And three, we were so spoiled rotten that we thought that these were really important things to start with. So it's hard for us to connect with this. On the flip side, we've all had some area of suffering, some area of calamity in our life. And because we've created a culture where we can only say positive things, uh, when we are walking through that valley, we feel very alone as if we're the only ones and there's no space or room to say anything. Um, so let's, let's continue through this list. Um, verse five, he talks about a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. Uh, this could mean a lot of things. Theolo- uh, scholars aren't certain. Uh, some people think it might be a reference to uh, physical intimacy, particularly with the follow-up line which is a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing Um, others think it could just be something more construction related or building fences or or whatever Um, a time to seek a time to lose to keep and a cast away so again there's there's this time there's this sense of there's plenty and then there's lack and there's a time for both and we kind of either intellectualize this or we just kind of hum the beatles song along in our head Uh, as we go through this passage without really thinking about, okay, I've had years of plenty, but there's a time for plenty and gathering, and there's a time for casting away. What does that, what does that mean? Am I looking for God's blessing only financially, uh, only through giving me stuff? Or am I also looking, he says, you know, blessed are you when they persecute you. Uh, Am I looking for God's blessing through persecution? I mean, typically, no. Um, so he, he, he builds this, this really long list of these are inevitable, inevitable things. We don't like to think about these. We don't like to talk about these. In a time like we're going through as a culture right now, um, I've talked with some of our, our nurse friends, and they're talking about how people are having to make different end-of-life decisions for loved ones. Because before when all the ICUs weren't slam packed full, um, people had a lot more time to make these kind of decisions. And our expectation here in, here in the States is, hey, if we can use science and uh, technology to keep someone alive, we keep someone alive without ever necessarily thinking that there is in fact a time to die. We don't wanna think about that. And so again, to go back to what Pascal said a couple weeks ago, we, we can't distract ourselves from death, and so we just stop thinking about it entirely. Um, but Solomon would obviously say, no, there's a, there's a time for both, and you're fooling yourself if you don't think of the other, if the other side. Um, then as we go into the, the final closing section of this, he says, uh, what gain has a worker for his toil? I've seen the business that God has given the children of man to be busy with. He's made everything beautiful in its time. And so if you, if you read this in light of Israel's history, we could see, uh, we start in the garden where Adam and Eve are living in this idyllic state. Uh, they're kicked out of the garden because they sinned. And then they, uh, you know, the, the, the rest of the history is they're trying to get into the land. They're going into exile. It's this very long, long process of, it seems like they're never actually there. And 
you come to the New Testament and you see the gospel spreading throughout the world and the apostles, everywhere they go, stop into the synagogues and they, that's where their starting point is. And they reason from the scriptures with the Jews who were there who believed. Well, how did those Jews get there? Well, it happened during the exile. And so if you look at the exile, it's a terrible, terrible time. Uh, if you look at the Roman conquest of uh, Palestine, it is a terrible time. As they tried to convert, forcibly convert Jews out, uh, they would put children, they, they would take a parent, parents, and take their babies in front of them and put them in like a big cauldron frying pan and literally cook them alive in front of their eyes if they wouldn't convert. Um, they would force them to do all kinds of unspeakable things, uh, more unspeakable than that, to each other if they wouldn't convert. And so all of this very dark time in Israel's history, uh, God has made beautiful in its time. And the beauty of that is that the gospel spread throughout the world um, at that time very rapidly because of the dispersion. Now, you can't think that the Jews are, are guiltless and this happened to them as if they were uh, not deserving. I mean, they had committed many, many sins and God had told them, hey, if you do this, I'll bless you. If you do that, uh, you know, you're going to suffer the same fate that all the nations that I'm driving out before you, you're going to suffer their fate. And so I think when we're in those moments where things are not working out, um, there needs to be an, an acceptance of it, but there also needs to be the hope and the understanding, the future faith of even though I feel really bad and I feel really dark right now, um, God is going to make something beautiful out of this in its time, not in my time, uh, in its time. And so, you know, you think of the first generation of Christians, uh, most of them were martyred and killed. The, you know, the gospel was made beautiful in its time, not in their time. I, you know, a lot of my background is mission stuff, and you study a lot of missionaries. The first group of missionaries, pretty much every, name the country, uh, pretty much the first group of missionaries everywhere they went, they were killed or died of, you know, some terrible sickness. And then generations later, some missionary walks in, has no clue about all the suffering and toil that's happened there, and then they see some massive uh, movement uh, to the gospel. And so God does make everything beautiful in its time. <clears throat> um, he, he gives us in verse 12, he gives us this statement. And this is one of his kind of summary statements. So if you're looking for, all right, let's, let's get out of the cynicism, Solomon. What's, what do we do? What do we do with this information? Uh, he says, I perceive that there's nothing better uh, for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Um, and that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all of his toil. This is God's gift to man. So in our case study one, he had just shown how pleasure is nonsense. And now here he is saying, take pleasure uh, or take some pleasure. How do, you, how do you see this? Is he contradicting himself? Well, in the first situation, it seemed to me as though the majority of, I guess, the case studies were um, whether those things were good as, um, I guess, the purpose or the ultimate thing to do. So, like, to simply only work, to simply only enjoy pleasures or things like that. Versus um, when he's saying it here, it seems to me that given the fact that there are, that there is, there are multiple different times in our lives to go through them appropriately and this the good ones enjoy them as best you can simply because that's why they are there so it's no there's no sense in lingering and wasting even the simple pleasures um, it because it's appropriate because of the given time of each one and the same thing with the negatives which is something we don't talk about in our culture i guess is even through the negative things go through them appropriately you know, and I guess as Pascal would advise against, don't, you know, or, or he would say just don't distract yourself from what's happening. A lot of times we want to not pay attention when negative things are happening. And so we don't learn from them. We don't grow from them. Um, and they become source, you know, source spots or just, you know, times that we don't want to reference. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Isn't that really Paul's point when he talks about I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? 
right? It, he's learned how to have plenty and to be in want yeah. and to recognize that both of those are from Christ's hand and they're all part of his plan for his kingdom. So you know, don't yeah. be bitter about it. Just I, I think a lot of it depends on what you focus, put most of your focus on. I mean, if you're focusing on the negative things all the time, I mean, get over it and move on because it's not going to going to help you. Right. I, I think this can even apply to our to our walk with God. You know, we think that God wants us to do something: take a job, have a baby, buy a house, make a move, uh, serve Him in some tangible way. And then the plan changes and you go, okay, God, I feel like an idiot now because I, I feel like you spoke so clearly on this and pointed me in this direction. And now here I am in the middle of nowhere, you know, dressed up like a rodeo clown. What's up with this? And so I, I think a lot of times we get this sense that God is sending us on, uh, sending us on a fool's errand. And I would say in, in many cases, I mean, go read the old prophets. One of them had to sit naked for two years. Um, you know, if there, if there ever was a fool's errand, that, that was one, uh, several of them, he says, Hey, you're going to go and you're going to talk, but I am going to, uh, close their ears so they can't hear you. Um, but you're muted. Oh, he doesn't call us to be productive. He calls us to be obedient. That's right. Yes, it's not that we have to be successful in it. Yeah. That was a lesson that, that took me a long time to learn. You know, I would, and again, I'm, I'm operating from an American mindset, which is where I live. You know, it's where I was raised and I was raised, hey, God, God leads you in some direction. You pursue that. And, but then we apply our efficiency and get things done kind of attitude that can do spirit, which I don't think is wrong. I think that's one of that is, it's both our strength and our weakness as, as Americans, um, is that kind of can-do attitude. But then we think, well, success equals accomplishing the goal rather than just being faithful along the journey wherever he sends us. Mm -hmm. And I think something that our brothers and sisters in the global church can really teach us is, uh, because they're not operating from that standpoint of, we have the resources, we have this will to force to make it happen, like, we do in the West. We think, well, with enough ingenuity, with enough applied resources, we'll make it happen. But, my, you know, the, the rebuttal will be, where's the Holy Spirit in that? Um, and, and the answer is, well, we're doing things in our own strength. And so used to, you know, like a, a time like now, I've had two trips canceled already. Um, there's talk of several other trips on the horizon being canceled, mission trips and such. You know, in years gone by, I would be figuring out, man, how do we make it happen? Because that's the goal that God gave us to, to hit. And now I'm thinking, well, I mean, God knows, God knows what he's doing. It's his mission, not mine. And I'm going to stay busy and stay faithful as best I can with, you know, if he keeps us in quarantine, it'll be in quarantine. If he lets us, lets us out, it'll be out. You know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Well, and that, that's what's interesting to me about the way he phrases the work that's given to us. It almost sounds... <laughs> He, he, to me, it almost sound, make, he almost makes it makes it sound like um, almost busy work. It makes it feel like um, it's just about doing, it, like keeping us occupied rather than necessarily accomplishing something. Yeah, um, or at least with the language that he's using in Ecclesiastes, and so or at, at any point. And so, like instead of God gave us the thing to do, to do it uh, and accomplish it, and 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 maybe even perhaps like the idea of doing things of our own will. Um, it's it, he seems to be speaking of work as something that he gave for us to do just to almost just to keep us busy as if it's not it, like accomplishing it is a secondary issue even at all yep. which is odd because like you were saying we don't think of that as i guess americans because what did we do versus are we doing the work properly mm -hmm. that he has given us i don't know it's just interesting yeah, work is one of these things where it's a paradox. So on the one hand, work was given to Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. Um, so it's not, work itself is not a curse, but there's a toil that comes with work. I, I remember my first offshore fishing trip. Uh, first fish we caught was a 20 pound channel catfish. It was the biggest thing I'd ever seen. Uh, I mean, that I caught and uh, 
the guys on the, the guy who's taking us, he goes, Oh man, you're going to throw that thing back by the end of the day. And, uh, sure enough, we caught 40 pound redfish. Uh, we caught a couple of sharks that day. We caught all kinds of stuff. Um, and I remember thinking, and I even said to that guy, like, man, you, you've got the best job in the world. You just get to go fishing every day. And at the time I didn't understand his answer because look, after a while, everything's a job. And so on the one hand, work is God given. And it's part of, I would say it's part of being made in the image of God is that we do work. On the other hand, as Solomon is pointing out, as that guy pointed out, there's toil with work. And there is this kind of just chasing after the wind of like, well, I mean, imagine if you're like an e-billing clerk or like you do something in data entry. It's just this mountain of, of ones and zeros that passes through your life that you just put in and they go out and then more come in and you, you know, it's like factory worker or something. Um, so we see, we see that, that God isn't necessarily efficient in the way that we want him to be efficient. In verse, uh, in verse 14, he says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear him. And so this is, this is kind of the non-statement statement. So in Job, uh, God does this to him a lot. So his three friends go, and there's chapter after chapter of them going back and forth about why is this happening to you. And the last portion of the book is God talking to Job and answering his questions. And Job kind of suggests it, and God says, okay, let me answer. And then he just asks him, you know, almost 100 questions, and none of them answer it. And he kind of just says, exactly, yeah. And you go, wait, what? God said, I'm going to answer it. And none of this was an answer. It was all just questions. Where were you when I made this? You know, can you tell me how many stars are in the sky? Can you tell me this? Can you it was just a, a thousand questions. And, and Job's response was, well, uh, God's higher than I am. And so this is kind of a statement like that. It's like, well, we don't understand it, but what God does lasts for forever. And you can't add to it. You can't take away from it because God is the one that did it. And again, we think of our own efficiency in our own personal goals, our goals as Christians, our goals as a church, if you're part of any organization, you know, those kind of goals. And we think, well, we, we've got to hit these. And for Westerners, we have to hit them quickly because it's all about the time. And here Solomon seems to go, well, I mean, God's going to do it when he wants to do it and with his purposes and his times. And, and there you go. That's the non-answer answer. Um, so I want you to, uh, let, let's kind of summarize some of this. Um, one, we see that there's a time, a time for everything, right? That's a pretty common theme throughout this passage. And so there are uncontrollable and unavoidable events of time. And there is a, a time for that, meaning like there is a, a place for that. There's space for that to happen. It's, there's an intentionality where it's going to happen. Um, and so I would kind of take a couple points of application for that. One, there's a time to embrace the bad that befalls us, and we should expect it. We shouldn't just expect everything, uh, in the words of one of my German friends, life is not a pony party, um, which is what they tell their kids when they, they are you know, wanting something extra or not being realistic. Uh, we can't just expect everything to always be our best life now, if you will. I mean, we make a lot of fun over Osteen, over that, that title and just a lot of stuff he says like that. But let's face it, first bad thing in our life that happens, we, you know, jump on the how long, oh Lord, where are you, oh God? You know, have you forgotten your servant Brian down here humbly, you know, doing, you know, right? That's our, we, we quickly go to martyr mode um, the first time something bad happens. Like say what you want about Joel, that's fine. We all have to figure out for our own selves uh, we are much bigger offenders oftentimes in practice, right? We may never stand up and say that, but I would say in practice, uh, you know, the thing that we're, criti we're criticizing others for, we're in fact full on embracing that God should just give us everything and our life should work out without struggle, without toil, without, um, any, kind of, without any kind of problem. Um, there's a time to end things. So we see this isn't just theoretical. This is a very practical thing. There's a time that things that bring us joy come to an end. Um, he talks about building, talks about tearing down. 
And I think so many times we get hung up on maintaining everything to always be the same. Again, personally, church, nation, culture, et cetera, at all of those levels, we think like this where, you know, we are used to this particular project or this particular element of my life or this particular blessing in my life, and we never think that it will end. But according to Ecclesiastes, we should walk into life with some expectation of I'm going to enjoy this while it lasts with the understanding that there's a time for this to be good and there's a time for this to evaporate and float away. Um, and again, this is, this is hard for us because we've been taught, well, only good things will happen. Um, third point on this would be lament and rejoicing should be regular practices for us. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't do a good job lamenting and we don't have a lot of, at least in the modern era, we don't have a lot of uh, songs instructing us. This is not something that gets preached on a whole lot. Um, and so part of lament is not hiding things. Uh, I grew up thinking, well, I can't say something negative about how life is because that goes against God. It's somehow sacrilegious. I can't say, God, you failed me. Even if inside I, I'm thinking, God, you failed me. I can't verbalize this because that would be sacrilegious. Um, and the reality is God can handle, God can handle our, our thoughts and our opinions. Um, and if you look back on Israel's history, I keep referencing the exile, but one of the things that happened in the exile is they didn't, there was, first off, there was no assumption that they could pretend like everything was normal. When they're getting marched out of the country and they're seeing the temple in the rearview mirror and Babylon in the front, there's no pretending like, well, it's, every, life is about to go back to normal. It's no, we're not in Kansas anymore. And so there, there's no pretending that everything is going to be fine. Um, and even when they get there, they're, they're not bitter about it, but some of the, the deepest points of Old Testament theology come out of this time period where they are forced to wrestle with God actually means business. God is holy and righteous. We are not. Um, we're his chosen people, but God uses the pagan nations to judge us. And, and there's, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But one element was they practiced lament. So there's the book of Lamentations, um, which is an obvious point of lament. It's, a, it's an acrostic, meaning every stanza, or every group of verses begins with one letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's, it's literally, the book is the A to Z of suffering. Psalms, I'm going to paste some, uh, some of these into the chat bubble there. These are Psalms of lament. David and others were, were very open with, with saying, now, I mean, that's, you know, a half dozen psalms out of a, a book of, you know, 100 plus psalms. So this isn't the, the only thing that they have to say. And, and I think Ms. Zoe said that, well, if it depends on where your focus is. If you're just sitting there dwelling on the past, get over it and move on. Um, so you don't want to o always and only be focused on lament, but there is a time for lament. This is kind of like the emotional Sabbath, if you will. We don't talk about Sabbath very much, but the idea of Sabbath is that um, God is not tired. Uh, he doesn't need rest, but he chooses to take a day of rest, and he instructs us to take a day of rest. And so this is permission from God. In fact, in the Old Testament times, it was, seemed to be very offensive if you didn't take it. It was a command from God um, that you take rest. And so whether you felt like you could do it or not, this was kind of your get-out-of-jail-free card of, you can take rest. And I think emotionally speaking, lament is that same thing where there is room in dealing with God for us to go, you know what, God, things are bad right now. And that's what the book of Lamentations and these Psalms, if you, if you go read through those with that in mind, you will see that the, you know, the ancient Jews took time to lament. And I think because of that, I think it's cathartic when they are able to say it. I mean, times in my life where I've struggled with something and gone into church and all the music's triumphant and everyone goes, how are you? What's my expected answer I have to say? I'm fine. 
you know, oh, I'm good. How are you? Right. And if, and if someone should try to go too deep, we kind of look at them as like, man, what kind of freak is that person? Um, they really wanted to know how I was doing, not just the cursory, how are you? And like, I can see everybody smiling and laughing. We've all had that experience, both on the, probably the giving and receiving end where on occasion, I don't know if you've ever asked someone, hey, how are you? And then they just start like telling you everything. You're like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is different. Um, but, but theologically, there is room to put into, not just to write it down and babble it, to put it into poetry, to put it into song, to put it into art, um, our feelings of uh, fear, worry, disappointment, uh, anger, all of these different things that you'll, you'll read in those Psalms, there is space for this. And so I think that's, that's a, probably a new practice, I would imagine, for everybody here. Um, there's one other thing I want to say on this, and that is there is something called the prayer of examine. Um, this came out of the monastic tradition, but there was a guy named Ignatius, and he wanted to uh, experience God's presence more. And so he would, he realized that he would go through his day and not ever really had thought about uh, God. And then he would wind up going, okay, where is God? And so he started, I think he did it three times a day, but he would stop. And basically he calls it um, uh, consolation and desolation. I do it with the kids sometimes and I call it, I'm thankful for and I'm sad about. And it, it's a quick way of doing kind of one line prayers. God, I'm thankful that we had a great bike ride today. You know, it's something very situational, not like we try to, it's hard to teach people how to get it out of, you know, the theological stratosphere of thank you for, you know, your aseity and something, you know, whatever, theological mumbo jumbo, um, to something very specific today. And the, the couple who taught me this when they were doing it in their living room, it was just the two of them and myself, and uh, he was talking about writing an article and he goes, God, I was struggling to get that article finished. Thank you for giving me the words to finish that article. And my first thought as the skeptic that I am was, how on earth do you know that God gave you those words? And I'm just, you know, in my mind, yeah, yeah, and like that. And immediately I thought, well, maybe this is why I don't feel like I, I see God's hand working in my life very often is I want to discount you know, the skills and mental power and everything else that ultimately he has given and thus every good gift is from him. Um, but the flip side of this, so like that's, that's pretty easy to recognize in gratitude. What are the daily things that God gives us? The flip side though, is to create a space to go, God, I'm sad that, and just name it. And I think there's, there's power in uh, naming things that are disappointing. Um, this can be a time of personal confession. This can be a time of couples confession. This can be a time of reconciliation uh, between couples, between parents and kids. Um, it's also a, a time to examine your own sin patterns. And so if I say, you know, what are some sins, we'll probably start our list with like really big bad ones. And we wouldn't start our list of sins with things like discontent, uh, ingratitude, we wouldn't start with these tiny little sort of theoretical sins. It's like, ah, oh, God's okay with those ones. Um, but the reality is when I practice ingratitude in small ways, this grows into bitterness in big ways. This grows into anger and malice towards others. And like before long, I'm breaking relationships with people because, you know, three weeks back I was practicing this small sin of ingratitude. And so the idea of taking this daily time, if you do it with a meal, that helps, of just a few minutes a day, God, thank you for... God, I'm sad about, and naming them, including learning, you know, what are your kind of trigger sins for you that build you into, you know, if unchecked, into much greater sins. We always, we always catch it when it gets explosive, and we always wonder, man, how did I get here? Um, but there's this, there's this progression that if we start back here on a day-to-day -day basis, chances are we can find a lot more of those, um, <clears throat> a lot more, more of those heart issue-related things. So I want to give everyone an assignment. Can I give you an assignment? I know everybody's just at home, so don't, don't tell me you're, you know, going out. 
Um, I, I'll, I'll give you your choice of assignments. How about that? You can either A, write a lament uh, that obviously you'll share with the group, or B, uh, practice the prayer of examine, and then you'll share your experience next week about that. So option A is write a lament. I would recommend reading those lament songs, um, song, song, psalms, uh, and just think, okay, what is, uh, you're going to share it with the group, so don't make it too personal uh, or something that you wouldn't want to share with the group. <laughs> but, um, you know, what is something that you are disappointed in, lacking in, afraid of, anxious about, etc. So if you feel like writing it out, if you're a poet, make it poetic. If not, don't worry about it. You can just write it out in, in layman's uh, language. Or the other option is practice the prayer of examine. Um, and um, yeah, each day and then talking about your experience um, with us next week. Uh, so some people might be thinking, you know, what if I'm embracing lament and that takes over any joy that, that God has given our lives? Um, I think we're actually, Solomon's going to answer this question uh, in, in the text in a few weeks where he talks about uh, sorrow is better than gladness. And I learn more from God from sorrow than gladness. Um, I don't think they're necessarily counter exclusive. Like there've been very dark times in my life where I experienced joy. There've been very blessed times in my life where I wasn't very joyful. Um, and a lot of that had to do more with my own perspective uh, than anything else. Um, but I think if we're using lament to get into bitterness, uh, that's obviously like a, a wrong jumping off point. However, uh, we often wind up bitter and we don't know how or why. And so maybe if we actually practice lament, uh, when I've done prayer of examine myself, uh, like I'll do it after a trip. I'm a big extrovert. If I go speak at a conference, it's three days of peopling. Uh, I'm on this massive adrenaline high. And then three days in, I'm exhausted because of that. And then three and a half days in, I've just landed from a flight and I'm in the car by myself. And so it's like this massive cliff. And everything could have been perfect. And I will be, you know, thinking through like, why am I even in ministry? I'm like, I'm a terrible dad. I'm a terrible this. I'm like, and it's just this self-hatred uh, that comes out of that. And so I've learned actually, if I go, hey, God, thank you that I had this good connection with that person. Thank you that I got to present this idea. Thank you for this good conversation. God, I'm sad about, and I start naming it out loud. Um, when we name it, it we're, we're not griping. It, it, it should, I would say it should take a kind of confessional tone. And so that might actually help us, um, help us avoid bitterness actually by practicing biblical lament rather than just ignoring our pain. Um, does anybody have any questions about the assignments or about this passage? I have a question about the assignment, but I okay. did have a question regarding the topic so <clears throat> this is something that i've thought about before in the past given like my own personal experiences with difficult situations or even friends that i have that i know and so i've i guess my question simply is what can we as a church do when we are not experiencing those kinds of negative situations right when we're in the lows where we're, we're not and not necessarily we're, we're having a great time but just everything's fine it really is um, verse, and then, it, but we know, or we find out of somebody in our congregation, and they don't necessarily need to be a friend or a close person, um, but just someone that we know through church and, and through that community. Um, how can, what should we do? What can we do? How, like, whether it be in during, like during a Sunday or a Wednesday night where we have normal church, or even outside of that context, like, what would be an appropriate way? for us to, I guess, get into the mindset of understanding that not everyone's happy all the time. And like, we need to help them through that. Cause I feel, cause I feel like a shame, shame is associated with that when you're not in that happy, go lucky, Jesus yeah. is the best and everything's going great. Yeah, and there's so, something wrong with you. Why don't you have enough faith that you're feeling bad about? Yeah, exactly. Or it's starting to bring them down. So we don't want to make anyone else feel bad. You know, yeah. different comments like that. So like, I guess just, 
I mean, this could be a, a, a question for anyone to answer if they have thoughts or opinions or if they've experienced anything, but I guess what can we do as, as just regular church going people who, who, who either know someone uh, who's going through that or even experience it ourselves? Um, so I think, uh, I think we have to create regular space for it. So I, I find this is true with my kids. If I go, Hey, how are you doing? Fine. How was your day? Fine. How was school? Fine. What'd you learn today? I don't know. You know, like the conversations are all one words. Um, but if we actually have some open time where people just start discussing and I, as a parent go, I'm sad about this today. That right there just gave them permission to feel bad. Um, and so that's typically when some good conversations come out. So I think one is, is you have to create space for those kinds of things. Um, a lady in our church, she's from Nigeria. So we, you know, we have people from 50 different countries in our church. She's from Nigeria and she was talking with me one day um, about something really bad that happened in her home country to her family. And I said, look, you've got you've to share this with the church. I said, we don't know. She goes, oh, our, yeah, but everything is so nice here. Our church is so happy. I don't, I don't want to be the one to bring them down. And I feel like every news I have from my home country is bad news. And I go, yeah, but we're living off in some like lollipop land thinking nothing's <laughs> wrong in the world because our experience <laughs> is nothing's wrong. And like that's not at all the world like you're helping us understand the world better and now we're compelled to pray with you and for you and for your home country and but it's but like where do we do that you know so we actually started a quarterly prayer for the nations night and i would just pick three or four different people or some topics and see who wanted to speak about them and you know i would you know being able to craft this i would pick the topics typically being heavier topics and so like the theme is on persecution or the theme is on poverty or the theme is on this. And so it opens up the conversation for them to go, Hey, it's not, everything is okay. Um, does anybody else have any other ideas about what can the church do to help during these times? No, but I did want to say I am uh, thankful for this time to get together. And I'm sad about, Brian thinking it's okay to give us homework right <laughs> off the bat. Well, I'm thankful that you're here. And uh, I'm sad that you need motivation. <laughs> um, I think one of the things we can do as a church is when people are sharing the hard things. Um, I, I, I don't want to say, it, you know, have a poker face, but it's very easy to respond with, oh my gosh, what did you do to bring this on yourself? And that's the wrong response. Uh, it, it, it doesn't help and it does guarantee they're not going to come to you again. No. Uh, sure. I think also we, we often, because we're so uncomfortable with the topic, kind of like Pascal said, we're uncomfortable thinking about the hard things. So we just divert, like you just told me some sad news. And so I'm going to give you some Christian platitude, like from a bumper sticker, so that we can move back to talking about the weather, so that we don't have to actually deal with the question. I mean, like if you're dealing with pain, that reminds me, like, hey, I've got this thing that I've never dealt with. And so I say something like, well, God works all things together for good, which mm -hmm. biblically is, is true. It's ultimately true, but in that moment, like that's not what, you know, like scripture says, weep with those who weep, bear one another's burdens. I mean, that's intended to be cumbersome and hard and it's I just hard. I want to fix people's problems. Christy will tell you. It's hard to uh, talk to somebody about something that they've shared with you if you haven't experienced it because you really don't know how they feel and what they're going through. I think. I think you you know. Yeah. And I, I think also it's um, for me, I will say, you know, for somebody, especially like somebody that you don't know, um, since we're a church, it's always just answering by prayer. Like, yeah, I'm going to be praying for you. And I think it helps, you know, because most at that time, most people don't even want to pray. They're so bombarded with the hurt and the pain that, you know, 
I think having somebody taking out that burden of praying for them, it helps, you know. So, you know, just offering, just praying for that person saying, you know, I'm going to be praying for you. And I don't think it's time to want to talk about like what you say, you know, oh, hey, the Lord does this, the Lord, all these verses. <laughs> no, that's not the time yet. It's just a time to sympathize with the person, whether you've had the pain you, or you have experienced it or not. But it's just to show sympathy to that person that I understand and and I'm praying with you because the word of God says, you know, he is close to those who are brokenhearted. So he, God basically also cries with them, right? So us as human, we should learn how to do that too, even though if we never experienced such a thing, but to show that and say, hey, you know, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, because sometimes that's all you could say, but at least you did it and say that you're there for them. Mm -hmm. At that moment, it probably doesn't show anything, but later on, you never know what it will do. So, yeah. I, I think also an answer to David's question um, when you're hurting, I think it's important to, to share. For me, it's so much easier to listen to other people's problems than to talk about my own. Mm. Um, in fact, I absolutely hate talking about my own um, for any number of reasons. But, uh, you know, it's, and, and, and some of that's just human pride, right? Like I, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be tough. I'm, I'm supposed to be like, we're, we are fitting a role. We're playing a part that we're, we're cast into. Okay. That gets especially hard in terms of like being on staff at a church or being a missionary or, you know, in, in like a parent child relationship, right? Like I'm supposed to be the one that's showing you, here's how you live. And here's how, if you, if you do this, it's going to work out this particular way. Um, so in any given role that each of us play, that, that we can let that become too concrete, too constrictive. And I think we can break that by just saying, I feel bad about and naming it. Again, uh, we've, we've done prayer of examine with our home group and um, our home group, we're really relational. We spend a lot of, like we should have a meal each week and we do a lot of chit chat and things will come up like, you know, we've been talking for four or five hours sometimes and then we'll do prayer of examine at the end. And it, it blows me away how many things we missed in conversation simply because we didn't ask that question, right? What do you, you know, what do you feel sad about this week? How are you feeling God this week? Uh, what of your pet, pet sins have you leaned into this week? But when you open the conversation up, people go, people just start sharing. Um, so, I don't know if there's any magic solution other than it's more, I would say it's more of like a discipline and a posture or a church. If you're thinking like church life, it's more of a church cultural thing where you have to have time. Um, our church does an invitation time. And okay. For those of you who are at our church, you need to understand my background. So we grew up with this really strict church and there's an invitation every week, but like, it's always supposed to be like confessional specific to the topic that was preached on. So if he's preaching on lust and people go forward, right? The logical assumption is, hey, that's what they're, you know, if he's preaching on anger, there's like, there's some kind of connection there. And uh, so I remember coming to Wilcrest and like, gosh, I can't say his name. I've told him this story before. Uh, it rhymes with Hector. Uh, he's up like every single Sunday. And like before I was on staff, like I didn't understand like Wilcrest's invitation time is very, very different. Um, and so in my mind, I'm thinking the old categories. I'm like, God, this guy just struggles with every single thing. Like, get it together, man. <laughs> um, I've told him this, and he's, he's had a, a really good laugh. He's like, no, that's more true than you realize. Um, but actually, like, people come up, and typically, nine times out of ten, it has absolutely zero to do with the sermon. And it's, here's this thing that's happening in my life. Can you just pray for him? Um, and so while I think invitations in that kind of pressuring sense are really, really dumb, I kind of like that if you walk into church on Sunday, even if we didn't preach about a topic that's relevant to you, you can come up and talk to somebody and go, here's what's happening. You know, pray for me and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so the assignment again, just to reiterate, uh, option A is write a lament. So I've posted all of the Psalms of lament. There's probably a few extra, this was a short list. Um, there are definitely times in like the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah where the, he's expressing lament. There's the book of Lamentations. So if you're looking for that, actually, if you, 
yeah, I'm sure if you got on YouTube and go how to write a, 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 a lament, I bet you there's people who have like very handy how to. So if there's, if that is your interest, I would, I would follow that down. Um, if uh, the other option was practice prayer of examine for this week and then tell us about, so in both, I want you to come back and share with the, share with the class, uh, but practice prayer of examine and let us know what was your experience? What did you learn about yourself? Uh, what did you learn about, you know, does naming your things you're sad about, does that make you sadder or does that make you uh, more accepting of the things you can't change? Uh, and I also, I posted a YouTube video. It's us doing it as a family. Um, and you'll hear some of the things in there that like some of the thank yous are like very, very mundane. And that's kind of the point. It's not, it, it's not a super spiritual time from the sense of like, you hear people pray and they, they wax eloquent and theological all of a sudden. And uh, it's nothing like that. It, 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 ideally, it would be very, very mundane, basic kind of, kind of things to say. All right. Any other last questions or comments? All right, I'm going to take everyone's silence as being satisfied. <laughs> Lizzie, are you trying to talk? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get, I had to turn it off mute. Um, so the prayer of examine is, that's not something I've heard of. So it's basically just thanking the word for simple things. Mm -hmm. and talking about things that you're sad about like is that the gist of it yeah that's that's the basic gist of it um i would say do it at least once a day but you're trying to think very situational to that day so the sad about things are, is typically what gets people down that could be things that were frustrating that could be times where you stepped across some kind of line for me that's typically traffic every day um, so it, it could be like, again, like think very much today, not my life as a whole. And so if you build it in as a discipline of doing this regularly, it does become your life as a whole, but it's these very little incremental points in your life. Okay. What about the, um, the part you, you said about praying about sins? What was that? Like, yeah, so that could be one of the things that goes in the I'm sad about category. Okay. Just repentance and with, with the other stuff. Yeah. And, and so we've done that. Um, th there are multiple marriage theories on fighting in front of kids. I grew up and my parents never did it in front of us. Um, Christy and I are like in a middle position where we will do it in a modified way, not publicly, but uh, in the presence of the kids. But a lot of times like they don't understand, like we're, we come to a point of agreement and conclusion and they may or may not understand that. And so our time of examine is actually a helpful way to go. Hey, I'm sad I lost my cool and said this thing. And so like it's, it's said in the ears of Christy or myself, but it's not necessarily to them because I mean, ultimately all sin is against God, but it's also, since it's a communal thing, um, I mean, sin is communal. We sin individually, but we also sin in community. Uh, so it, it just provides a space to say, hey, I was out of line. But, but the, the, the sad category could encompass many numbers of, many number of things. My emotion words aren't that nuanced. So someone else can feel free to, free to fill in. All right, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me by text or email or whatever your preferred platform is. Otherwise, I will see you all next week. Okay, good night. Good night. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for staying. Bye, everybody. Bye, Melody. Bye. <laughs>